What's up everyone, back here with another comic book review. I'm going back into some vintage comics that I wanted to share with you. This is a six issue story arc of the Avengers going from Avengers issue 334 to issue 339. Uh, those of you who may know it, it's called the Collection Obsession and it is known for being the first story arc by writer Bob Harris. Bob Harris, uh, who's a writer and editor but uh, he had a pretty long, extensive run on the event, writing the Avengers in the 90s, and this was his first arc, taking over writing duties from Larry Hama. This is from the summer of 1991. Uh, Marvel was doing this kind of summer event thing, uh, but it was all contained in the Avengers. It wasn't like a big crossover event like they do nowadays, but it was a bi-weekly or bi-monthly, bi-monthly. Bi it's whatever of those two where it's two come out uh, every month. So uh, this series is going to be a spoiler review. So uh, if you're if it looks cool to you and if you're interest, interested enough into tracking down these comics, uh, go for it. And then, uh, or you can just watch this video and see what I have to say about the story. I'll go through it and make it as fast as I can. Uh, this was a lot of fun. It was good. Some parts were dry and kind of drawn out, uh, but once you understand that they were uh, filling in the quota of putting out two issues a month, then you start to understand why. But I really started on it because of this first part right here. I really just found it and bought it because it's got one of my favorite Marvel heroes ever, Quicksilver, on it, even though he's totally getting beat up on this cover. And that happens on the inside too, spoiler alert. Uh, but I pretty much buy everything that has cool Quicksilver moments in it. And, uh, this first issue is my favorite, it's the best in my opinion, and I'm really glad because it's the only one that Quicksilver is in. <laughs> but I'm gonna get started getting in here. Yeah, good old 1991 Avengers. So, written by Bob Harris, this first issue also sticks out a lot because it is the one that Andy Kubert does the art for. And uh, Andy Kubert's art in this is so good. Really reminds me of his father Joe Kubert's art in this, uh, just from the... just from the, the, the art style and the expressions, reminded me of some Joe Kubert. So, uh, gonna get right into this. Starts off with a ship crash landing on the moon, and when you got the moon, you got the Inhumans, because the Inhumans live on the dark side of the moon. And in this time, in, uh, in Marvel Comics, uh, Quicksilver's been married to Crystal of the Inhumans for a while now. Uh, that's been touched on a lot in the Fantastic Four comics. And uh, so he's been hanging out with the Inhumans. I believe Black Bolt, their king, has appointed Quicksilver to be their uh, kind of a military leader or something. So uh, currently he doesn't really hang out with the Avengers anymore. Uh, or not lately, he's still an Avenger. But Quicksilver, Karnak, uh, Alpha Primitive, who uh, they're kind of the minions of the Inhumans. They do all the, the grunt work basically and this inhuman called Tenberius uh, go out on this scouting mission to find out what just crashed on the moon. Uh, Andy Kubert's art, super cool right now. He draws this lightning bolt really jagged on Quicksilver. Look at all of his muscles popping right there. But the first thing I noticed is that he gave Quicksilver pointy ears. <laughs> very, very elvish, you know, kind of looking. And uh, reading this story, I really get the feeling that Bob Harris got on this book and he just told everyone like, just have fun, go, go crazy. And then Andy Kubert probably put that in as his own little, as his own little art thing, and the editors were like, "Yeah." And so, it, it doesn't get mentioned. It's just the way it is. Quicksilver's got a pointy ear in this comic, so <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, Andy Kubert's art has everyone looking really pissed in here. Like, you look at Karnak, look at Quicksilver's neck veins popping out right here. From what I understand about Timberius, he's he's an, he's an older inhuman villain that worked with Maximus the Mad quite a bit. They mentioned something about him getting pardoned by Black Bolt, which I could see him doing if uh, inhuman... Uh, if they... if they... if an inhuman was a bad guy, but then paid their debts and then he found their abilities kind of useful. Uh, so they're on the scouting mission. He kind of insults the Alpha Primitive and uh, Quicksilver gets really mad at him for it. I love how Bob Harris writes uh, Quicksilver's voice, his dialogue, he really gets it. He threatens him with this, uh, uh, if you if you insult the Alpha Primitive again, I shall gladly strip your bark and make kindling of you. And uh, that's good stuff. You know, uh, uh, I have some later issues of Avengers comics from the 90s that Bob Harris writes, and he really gets Quicksilver's voice. Uh, kind of uh, arrogant, very confident, and 
you know, hot head, uh, but I love it. And uh, getting into this, there's the spaceship that crashed on the moon. They're wondering what it is, and Quicksilver has got a feeling he should call in the Avengers. And so that's what he does. And get this introduction to the bad guys. These bad guys are called the Brethren. They're very mysterious, and we'll be finding out more about them as the story goes on. But pretty much the only three characters from the Brethren that you have to know about are these three characters right here. This is the main bad guy of this story. His name is Thane Ector. This is his female uh, lover or lieutenant named Sybil Dorn, and that is the Fool. He's just referred to as the Fool, kind of this weird looking uh, uh, kind of monkey imp thing. <laughs> And so they're just kind of, they, they make it sound like they've been in captivity for a really long time. They've finally broken free and that they're ready to go. They're ready to go wreck some dudes and cause some damage. And uh, then cuts back to Earth. Uh, the Avengers are working out. This is something I really love that pretty much only old comics do. I don't see this in, in newer comics anymore. That actually has to show the superheroes staying in shape. I really like that. And uh, something that Bob Harris is known for is introducing Crystal and making her a part of the team uh, in the 90s, uh, putting her in the Avengers. He really pumped up the Black Knight uh, as a member of the Avengers a lot. And uh, so this 90s team, a lot of people probably aren't familiar with these days, but it's got characters like Cersei from the Eternals, who I don't know anything about. I don't know nothing about the Eternals. It's got this guy Rage, who I also don't know anything about, but he's kind of written in this story as the young, kind of new recruit guy. I'm pretty sure he just has enhanced strength, you know, and uh, something to do with his namesake, Rage, probably. But uh, Bob Harris has got Hercules' dialogue down pat. You know, he's, he's there's a lot of fun banter between Rage and Hercules in this story that I really love. Right now, Hercules is spotting Rage as he does some bench pressing right here. And, uh, and Hercules says this, uh, and I will ever be at his side if a mishap should occur. Come now, where is your spirit, your metal? Nothing will happen. I am with thee. And then Cersei walks in, and Hercules immediately ditches Rage, right? He's, when he's in the middle of probably his last set. And uh, he's struggling right here and just has to drop the, the weights. And uh, he's like, hey, man, you were supposed to be spotting me. And he's like, yes, lad, but the lovely Cersei did need my attention. <laughs> And so then they almost get into it, and Captain America's got to break it up. But then they receive the distress call from Quicksilver. And then Crystal of the Inhumans, Quicksilver's wife, shows up uh, with the help of the Inhuman dog, Lockjaw, who can teleport uh, from the moon to the Earth. And uh, she pretty much delivers uh, the same thing. This is like all this stuff's going down. Uh, she was hoping that her sister-in-law, Scarlet Witch, would be here, but she is not. And uh, you know, we got Quasar on this team as well, uh, another Marvel staple hero from the 90s. So they're like, all right, let's go to the moon and uh, uh, lend them a hand. Apparently there's a force field and they don't know what's become of Quicksilver and the scouting crew. And uh, so they're going over to investigate. A little bit of a good exchange right here between Quicksilver and the Vision, uh, kind of her reflecting on how they, they married the Maximoff twins and both of those marriages right now are kind of on the fritz. Uh, especially with Vision, we got White Vision right now, in the, or as some people call him, and currently in the 90s Marvel comics, where he's pretty, he's pretty robotic, he doesn't have much of a personality, so that obviously wouldn't be good for his marriage. So she's just kind of reflecting here on how those marriages are falling apart. Last time they saw each other, things were really happy. And uh, getting into here, introduction to the Inhumans real quick. Looking cool right here, got, got Black Bolt, their king. Got Gorgon, Medusa. I've never seen her look like this. This is an interesting costume. We got Triton, and uh, they're trying to blast their way through it. Not even Black Bolt and Gorgon can get through the the force field that Quicksilver is in. And uh, but then Quasar's got some Vision and Quasar got some idea. They pretty much come up with some some stuff to do. And then uh, Quicksilver totally got his ass handed to him off screen. We didn't get to see that. And uh, but uh, it's kind of that classic thing where you have have the bad guys like punk the heroes real quick to show how powerful they are, especially uh, the mutant uh, super speed man Quicksilver, and uh, he's trying to he's trying to get some more information. But Quicksilver just says, uh, "You you'd best kill me uh, because an Avenger does not give in to torture." 
And Sybil Dorn tells him, He'll not break, Lord, despite all our efforts. This one is made of sterner stuff. Indeed, he could be one of us. Of course, Thane Hector is not interested in him. He kind of belittles him, saying that he's, his genes aren't good enough to be a member of the Brethren. So you kind of don't know, like, what is their deal? Do they recruit people? Do they conquer uh, worlds? What do they do? Uh, you got the fool giving Thane Hector advice, as he, as he always does uh, in this series. Not so much of a fool. But he pretty much tells him, like, hey, that, that woodland-looking guy looks uh, like he would uh, give under some pressure. <laughs> That's exactly what they do. And uh, he pretty much asks him where he is. I don't know what he snaps right here. Maybe just, like, his arm or maybe a branch off of his head. And then uh, Timberius spills the beans that they are on the moon. It's not really something worth conquering, but they are orbiting the Earth. And what's cool right here is that he, Thane Hector has heard of the Earth heard of the Earth because he knows it as the planet that first defeated Galactus. Uh, that's not really important. You don't see Galactus in this story, but I did like that as his motivation. Like, yeah, the Earth, that's a planet worth conquering. We're really lucky that we broke out of captivity and now we get to instantly take down a planet that's like notable like that. Quicksilver runs at him, tries to get in a good hit, but Thanector says he's been bred for war, fighting, speed. So he clocks him again one more good time. Uh, looks like he was going to squish his head like a berry, but then the Alpha Primitive comes in and uh, he squishes his head instead. And so that's kind of like some sort of brethren tradition that to spill the first blood. So then basically uh, the Avengers break in. Inhumans are lending him a hand. And then Thane, Hector, and uh, Sybil Dorn, and pretty much the important ones, uh, they teleport over to the Earth. And then the Avengers realize that the the members of the Brethren that they are fighting, they kind of suck after after their leader left. And so, uh, kind of hinting at something that would be important later, at some sort of telepathic connection. Then we see the Watcher showing up, and uh, that, uh, that 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 means something important is going down. I like that when some cosmic stories happening, the writers like to include the Watcher because that that's a pretty good sign. It's like, oh, it's a big deal. <laughs> so uh, the Watcher pretty much tells him, like, hey, yeah, uh, go in there and uh, find out what's all this. The Watcher is tasked with only able to watch. He can't interfere. Even though he's kind of interfering already, he's pretty much being a tour guide for the Avengers, taking them into the crashed ship. They're finding weird stuff like shrunken down cities and civilizations in bottles. And then uh, you turn the page. And if you know the name of this story, the collection obsession, then you could probably guess that the, their captor that they broke away from is the Collector, uh, who I'm a I'm a big fan of. He's one of my one of my favorite cosmic Marvel villains. Uh, and yes, I do. When I read his dialogue, I do hear Benicio del Toro's voice, uh, the guy who played him in the movies. And that's really cool. Captain Merc is kind of like, oh man, uh, this guy means business. If he could take down an elder of the universe like the Collector this easily. And so you get this kind of cool little outro, this uh, uh, kind of narration by the Watcher, pretty much explaining what just happened, uh, that the that these events are going to be big and that the Brethren just escaped from the Collector's uh, collection. So that's part one. Spend the most time in part one because that was my favorite issue. And then uh, it was it was even, like by today's standards, it would probably be more like an alpha issue or an issue zero. It's kind of what... It's, it's not really the beginning of the story, but it is, you know, but now the story's gonna get going. All of that was just introduction. And uh, so we're gonna get into it again. Part two, now we're going into the Ron Lim covers. Ron Lim, uh, one of the best 90s Marvel artists ever. And uh, especially when we're getting down to the cosmic uh, storylines. Uh, but now we've got art by Steve Epton. I love Steve Epting. Of course, he goes on to, to, to be the main man in Ed Brubaker's Captain America run that I really love. But it was really fun to see early 90s Steve Epting. And uh, it's, it's a lot, dare I even say, cartoonish. Not as refined, but this is early Steve Epting. Uh, you got two anchors in this issue. You've got, uh, uh, like, look at that. That's, that's a, that's a... That's a far cry from the uh, Hubert art we were just seeing, but this picture right here is inked by Tony Dezunga or Dezuniga. Uh, uh, but later on, then Tom, Tom Palmer 
who inked a lot of John Buscema stuff, uh, gets on Ink and Deep. In fact, like right over here, that's this is Tom Palmer inks. And all right, look how much better the bad guy looks already. Let's see here. He looks like he looks like squishy and just kind of unthreatening here, and a little more scarier here. That's more like it. So pretty much they teleport to Earth. You don't really see it happen, but they're pretty much saying that they're already conquering the Earth. Gonna burn through this. She kicks around the fool, even though he gives pretty good advice. And, uh, and you got this bit right here where Captain America threw his shield at Thane Ector. He throws it back and it goes through the vision and uh, back into Captain America's hand, which I thought was funny. I like this Hercules dialogue right here. Hercules and Rage are going to go and uh, protect a group of kids from being attacked by the Brethren. Hercules says, Does the cowardice of these Brethren know no boundaries? They call themselves warriors, but in Olympus, even the lowliest of satire has more honor. And Rage just is like, Yeah, you tell him. <laughs> so he's just kind of like at a point now where he just goes along with whatever he's saying. And uh, you got Cersei shooting some eye lasers catches Thane Ector's eye and he says uh, the Lady Dorne fell to buy a Terran of exquisite beauty and uh, gets him fighting with the Vision Vision tries to do his Vision's trying to get up to his old shit again and just stick his hand through people but it doesn't work it kind of goes unexplained but Thane that causes Vision pain and knocks him out and uh, and then Thane Ector kind of beats them he's trying to take He's trying to take uh, Cersei as kind of like a trophy. Now we're back to the Tony the Zuniga inking. Or it's just kind of this, this, yeah. Art, art's not the best right now. It'll get good. He starts cleaning Captain America's clock and it's kind of right now, it says I could do this all day type moment. And even Thane Ector is impressed with Captain America's uh, drive to continue to fight. That these must be He's, the, the legends that he's heard about Earth are starting to have more weight. Get this kind of poorly drawn blank stare, Black Widow flying through the air. And, uh, yeah, and then Thane Ector teleports away with Cersei. And Rage kind of says, like, oh, she can take care of him herself. But look what they did to Cap. They really, uh, while everyone else was goofing off, uh, they, they, really, they really ganged up on Cap and... Uh, uh, beat him senseless I believe and so then we kind of get this it's like the other half of the story is then this B team of Avengers which we're going to spend a lot of time on which consists of Hank Pym, Black Panther, Beast and Quasar and they're they're still on the moon they're pretty much tasked with investigating the Collector where the Brethren came from anything they can find out to exploit a weakness from the Brethren and uh, at this time period Hank Pym I, I can't remember what's his deal he's got the red jumpsuit look so he's, he's not Giant Man or Yellow Jacket or anything. So he's just Hank Pym. He's just a smart guy team member right now. Uh, Beast is written really weird by Bob Harris. Uh, really, he, he, wanted to, he wanted a comic relief, and he picked Beast for some reason. Whenever I read Beast, I expect him to be very snooty, uh, kind of funny in a cheeky way. But, like, let's just read some of his dialogue. Uh, I'll, I'll get to a part right here. So they're trying to wake up the collector. They're not really having much luck. And uh, let's see right here. Yeah, Beast is sitting here right there. The art's really good. We're, we're back to that Tom Palmer inking. And then the Beast says, ah, the joys of teamwork. I get goosebumps just contemplating it. And uh, just stuff like that. Quasar zaps him with some beam. And then it wakes up the collector and uh, Beast jumps in Hank Pym's arms. And he's like, oh, Beast is kind of weird. And uh, the collector woke up. He's, he packs a wall up, so he starts plowing away at them. And then uh, uh, they have a little scuffle, but then they beat him like that. They beat him uh, with the Beast shrinking down from a Pym particle. And then there's this kind of funny bit where he says, good job, Henry. And then Beast says, couldn't have done it without you, Henry, since both of them go by uh, Hank. Got Hank Pym and Hank McCoy. And then Hank Pym says, we are rather impressive, aren't we? It's like, oh, it's so cheesy, but <laughs> it's whatever. So we get going a little and uh, they pretty uh, Collector wakes up and they just pretty much start talking about the brethren, and how we defeat them and blah, blah, blah. They're going to shrink down and travel into the Collector's shrunken down cities and find out how they broke out in the first place. For some reason, uh, right now, Hank Pym can't shrink down. 
uh, maybe all his years of, of being a superhero uh, affected him to where Hank, uh, or pen particles can't shrink him down anymore. So he's pretty much going to pretty much take a seat and guide him through. But the collector, who can't be trusted, just kind of leads him into a bunch of tiny, tiny civilizations or germs that are going to eat him and stuff. That's the end of part two. Going into part three, going to start speeding this up a little. Really cool shot. This this is great art. This cool angle of Thane Actor looking all evil. Got the fool down there. You got, you know, you got his uh, his girl right there standing there looking all evil. Uh, kind of stuff that doesn't make sense where he just kind of makes his citadel appear at the top of the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center. Then he makes his giant soldiers come up and just start wrecking dudes. He's going to conquer them all. Captain America has got a heel, got his clock cleaned last issue, so he's pretty much going to be the man in the chair right now. Uh, calls in the rest of the Avengers, get some Iron Man, get some Black Knight in here, and uh, tells him to go for it. Jumps back a lot to the B team, uh, just trying to just trying to fight their way through all the the weird stuff in the collector's collection. And uh, right here too, you thought it was weird that uh, Hank Pym contacts Beast through his Avengers ID card, which has like a little phone on it. So their their ID cards also ask or act as their communications devices. And then that team discovers uh, this really lame looking uh, Neanderthal cave people species that it's kind of weird that they're like, why are they in the collector's collection? You just gotta assume that they're like an extinct species. Something is unique about them to where the collector would want them in the first place. Uh, but then they pretty much get antagonized really easily and already want to throw down. Here on Earth, uh, the heroes are just getting pummeled. Iron Man getting pummeled by these giant brethren soldiers. Hercules getting blasted away. Iron Man's like, oh my gosh, we gotta tell Cap that we got our butts kicked. And uh, then here, Sybil Dorn is is super extra flirting with Thane Ector. I think she can she's feeling threatened by the presence of Cersei. And then he's pretty much like, uh, yeah, I gotta go. And she starts calling him on it. She says, do you think me a fool? You go to her, the Terran uh, witch we captured in the city called, called Paris. Oh yeah, that's where they were fighting before. So he's pretty much like, hey, I'm, I'm the Thane of the Brethren. I can do what I want, uh, even though it's against our code. We, we don't take prisoners. We, we just kill everything. So we're going to get going like there. Uh, the fool is pretty much trying to comfort her, saying like, hey, Thane Ector is our leader. We can trust him. She just kicks him again, and he warns her, like, careful, because uh, sometimes it's, it's wise to listen to the fool, and that there's a fine line between being... Uh, uh, between the idiot and the wise man. Over here, Cersei, who I don't know her powers, I guess she's trying to transmutate her restraints, uh, focusing and turning them into flowers, but it doesn't work. Uh, apparently they're pretty advanced. And he's just trying to be all evil and also kind of flirty. He starts confronting her, being like uh, how, yeah, I'm evil, I conquer, I conquer planets and I, I kill species, but uh, you can't help but be attracted to me. He totally lays it on her, and you think Cersei's gonna be like, "Ew, get away from me, you freak!" But uh, she know that she knows that he is right. For some reason, there is a strange attraction between them. There is a strange connection that they share. I'm reading this, and I'm going like, "What? Come on, Cersei! Like, resist a little, you know?" So just kind of weird. Uh, but then now, Thane Hector comes back, and the fool gets mad, zaps him with a random head laser, and saying like, "Hey, she's not one of us. She shouldn't be here." And uh, cutting back to the B team, who's all shrunken down. Uh, they calm down uh, these cave people who uh, their leader, his name turns out to be uh, Naka. He pretty much tells them like, yeah, the brethren uh, came through here and uh, they came through pretty much the big tubes uh, that, uh, that the air travels in to let in air and all these little miniaturized civilizations. And then for some reason, in this very same issue, Captain America's already good again. He's back, he's back in the fight and uh, tosses his shield at these bad guys to no effect. Uh, Crystal, Crystal uses Lockjaw to just teleport them to the Earth's crust. And I'm like, this is that classic thing. It's like, why don't you just do that to everyone? <laughs> it's like, wow, they're so invincible. Just do that to Thane Hector. Teleport him in, like, into the sun or something. I don't know. But uh, 
then that would be a very short story and there wouldn't be any more story to read after this. <laughs> so then, bam, done with that one. Moving on along here on issue four, another Ron Lem cover. Uh, this one it, it kind of bothers me for some reason. It's weirdly off balance. I don't know why. I think I just scoot uh, Sybil Dorn and Cersei, who look like they're having a bit of a cat fight, scooch them a little more into the center, change the angle to have Thane Ector uh, centered a little more. But whatever, who cares? Uh, this is where it starts getting weird. Starting to learn more about the Brethren. Uh, pretty much the Fool and Thane Ector exchanging a lot of dialogue. Pretty much uh, they're in the sewers. The Fool is like, oh my gosh, this planet is filled with uh, uh, filth and, and muck. He just starts stuffing his face with it, super gross. And he's revealing that uh, they are in fact brothers. The Fool and Thane Ector are brothers, uh, which is really odd. Uh, but then it's like those are secrets that only they know. They can't let the rest of the brethren know that uh, there are there, that there's actually some some things to be ashamed of in their history. Really disgusting stuff about them. Uh, the plot pretty much thickens, and uh, then he pretty much Dan Hector is like, no, we're a warrior race. We're better than this. We're not filthy, disgusting creatures. And the fool is like, no, you know we are. You know we are. You know where we came from, and tempts. Thane Ector, and then he just falls on his knees and starts partaking in the muck eating in the sewer. Super gross. That made me that made me a little grossed out when I read that at first. And so then we got the B team of the Avengers flying around still on their miniaturized ship. They brought Naka with them, get some answers. Uh, Hank Pym's trying to figure some things out, and uh, then the Watcher shows up, and he's pretty much. Uh, that comforts Hank Pym, and then he knows that whenever he sees the Watcher, that uh, that means something is going on, which tells him that he is on the right track. Even this bit right here in the narration, that uh, in the shadowed face of the Watcher, Hank Pym swears he sees the barest of smiles. Uh, something about the Watcher is that he, he, he has broken his code and interfered in the uh, affairs of man before, because even though he's tasked with always watching the Earth and recording every historical event, uh, he he loves the Earth. He, after watching it for so long, he, he never wants to see it destroyed. So he does break his code every now and then and, and helps them out. Then we got Crystal over here. She's officially submitting her application to join the Avengers. Uh, I'm kind of wondering, like, did the fighting stop? <laughs> Are the Brethren no longer currently wreaking havoc all over the world? Uh, then we got this bit right here where Apparently Thane Ector had uh, scrolls, old records of their conquests sent to Cersei so she could learn more about them. She learns that, like the Eternals, that the Brethren were also made by the giant Celestials, the mysterious cosmic giants from ancient times. Sybil Dorn busts her, starts yelling at her like, hey, you're not meant to read those, you're not one of us. And uh, Cersei just really knows how to push her buttons and mocks her. And, uh, and then they throw down. They throw down pretty good. Variety chops her in the neck, lasers her with her eyes, but then Sybil Dorn uh, has got a few surprises of her own. She lasers her back, jumps on top of her, and just starts turning into muck. And uh, thank God that was in the same issue where it opened with them eating muck, otherwise I'd be even more confused. That just shocks Cer Cer Cersei, and she's like, what the hell are you? Then Thane Hector comes in, he's pissed, tells her to stop. She doesn't, so he lasers her off turns back into regular Sybil Dorn form, and she pretty much runs away getting mad, being like, I'm totally gonna tell the rest of the brethren that you're that you're not adhering to our code. And uh, Thane Actor is just concerned for Cersei, wants to make, make sure that she is all right. And uh, even though he's not permitted to tell her the truth about their heritage, where they come from, uh, he is compelled to. So he tells her that basically they're from the disgustingness, the, the muck and grime, uh, from that the Celestials made. Ends here with coming into where the uh, where the Collector was keeping the Brethren, and then Naka just kind of shrivels up and turns into a raisin and dies. And that is the end of part four. On to part five, which famously got uh, misprinted up here that it, it says part four again, even though that last one was part four. This is actually part five. So just judging by the cover, you know that there's a bad guy above Thane Ector since as the series progresses, you start sympathizing for the Brethren, especially Thane Ector, a little more. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that without uh, Cersei. 
So uh, at first I was like, why, what is with this weird, like kind of non-romance between Cersei and Thane Ector, the bad guy, uh, who I'm still mad at for punking Quicksilver at the beginning of this. But it, it, it is important to the story that uh, that there is kind of a there's kind of a tragic story to these brethren. So as the story continues, uh, these shrunken down heroes are investigating where the brethren came from. They get confronted by this uh, this creature. We'll find out a little more about him. He's all shriveled up and old looking, really ancient. Jumps back over here. The fool kind of. Uh, is trying to comfort Sybil Dolan some more, that she is out to go pretty much uh, tell uh, all the brethren that Thane Thor is not fit to lead them anymore. And over here, the B team of Avengers grow back into normal size uh, to finally report on the news that they have found. Uh, I forgot to mention in a previous issue, Nick Fury radioed in and told them that uh, autopsies from uh, the brethren's victims showed that they had no bacteria in them. So that's kind of important. Uh, they brought this ancient old guy with them. I think Quasar is making some sort of stasis field to keep him alive. His name is Olar, and he is the first or the oldest of the brethren. They just left him there to die. So uh, they weren't expecting to see him again. The fool has this floating ball thing, and it kind of spies on them, reports to him, and he starts freaking out like, oh no, they got... They got up. They captured a brethren. They they're gonna study him. They're gonna learn our secrets. They're gonna learn our weakness. Then he sees that the collector is even with the Avengers. Like, hmm, I've got a plan now. So he comes in, uh, interrupts Sybil Dorn's little insurrection that where she's pretty much uh, accusing Thane Ector of treason, and says like, hey, he kept he kept the the human girl, uh, Cersei, around for a reason. You know, now we now we see that the Avengers have li aligned themselves up with the collector. And they hate the collector. They they hate they hate humans. They wanna they wanna kill the earth and everything, but they abhor the collector. So uh, Thane Hector he even gets pissed at Cersei. Even he's fooled by the fool. So it's kind of ironic the fool is is somehow the leader. He leads the entire brethren in his own way, just through the power of influence. So uh, very ironic that the that the fool is actually not a fool at all. So he comes in and starts gloating at Cersei because now uh, all the brethren are going to take the fight to the Avengers and this because they want to kill the Collector. And then over here, they're studying Olar until uh, Hank Pym and Beast get zapped. Whoever did the zapping, uh, Olar says, like, you did this? And he says, uh, they're getting too close. They must not learn how to defeat the brethren. Olar says, then you will free me. He says, no, I'm going to kill you. And he just kills Olar. That was kind of worth it. So I was like, why'd you bring Olar then? It didn't really amount to anything. Kind of random and weird. Jarvis tells the Avengers that the Brethren have showed up now. And uh, Thane Actor is like, hey, yeah, face me. We want the Collector. I love this bit right in here where Hercules... Hercules has himself a good little fight scene with Thane Actor. He says, I say thee most assuredly, nay, creature of germ and things most foul. And so they, they've learned now that they're composed of germs and, and pretty much filth. And uh, kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's what the story is. Uh, Thane Actor is just kind of beating them senseless. Uh, Captain America trying to get in some good hits, but he just kind of runs past him. Shoots Black Widow and goes for the Collector. So he exclaims his hatred for him once more and just starts just starts beating him senseless and uh and then he's gonna lay down the finishing blow even the avengers are like man we gotta stop this he's gonna murder the collector and then the collector's eyes glow and he says no now it all begins and then an explosion happens the watcher says uh it was the pulling aside of the curtain the end of deception and the revelation of truth Re yeah, revelation of truth crystal uh tells them all to look and bam there's the collector now I know what you're all thinking. You're like, what the hell? Why, why does the collector look like that? It's so weird looking. That's so weird looking. That's like, that's like the combination. That's like design combination of some, some Jack Kirby friggin' George Perez like weirdness right here. Uh, yeah, very interesting. <laughs> kind of weird. 
uh, but he starts saying how he's he starts pretty much gloating on how he's fooled all of them. All of this has been according to his plan, that he's ready to make his move. Not a big surprise once you remember that the story is called The Collection Obsession. Uh, <laughs> unless you were thinking the whole time, because uh, uh, fortunately I do think that the final part was the last issue I found and, and bought. And uh, because the cover of the final part is is giant collector looking monster right there. And uh, so uh, if you just look at that cover, it's not really a surprise. Uh, up to that point, you're just kind of telling yourself, well, I guess the Brethren is the collection obsession, the, 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 the obsessed collection, collector obsess, obsession. And anyway, so this is the final part. Big showdown, big bad guy revealed. Collector looks huge. It's kind of brushed under the rug really quickly. Just says like, hey, this is my true form. I'm ready to rule the earth. He values, uh, uh, he values earthlings, Terrence. He wants them in his collection so bad that he's never been able to do it. Now's his chance. So now he's going to reveal his true form. That's stupid. That's lame to me. Uh, the co the cool thing about the collector is that he's got he's got really cool stuff. He's got really cool creatures, items, you name it. He could have had something that powered him up, but it just kind of doesn't make sense that he's had this true form all along. It's like why have I never seen him turn into that before? There's an old Incredible Hulk comic where Incredible Hulk and Man Thing beat the Hulk beat or beat the collector. And uh, uh, it's like, why didn't, why, why didn't he ever turn into this? <laughs> Apparently he's all powerful or something. And so he starts gloating basically, lots of coloring, great coloring work, great inking work. Yeah, this, this, it's not Steve Epting's best, but it's really cool seeing his, uh, him really kind of cut his teeth on this Avengers story. Uh, randomly, the fool and Cersei appear on this rooftop. Uh, where the fool just kind of starts gloating on like from here we can see like uh, uh, Thane Ector beat your team then he's like oh no oh no like the the, the bad guy he says oh the calamity oh tragic fate oh and Cersei says oh shut up you suck just knocks him out that made me laugh and then she admits uh you lived up to your name fool when you fell for my shrinking violet routine like okay at least she acknowledged that she was kind of playing the part of kind of a ditz uh, so that she could get to where she's at now so that she could re-enter the fight. Uh, the Collector goes over the Brethren's origin some more. There's, there's the Celestials. Uh, their enigmatic ways going out here shows them creating the Eternals, which are great and magnificent. And then there's the other side of the coin. Uh, they make, they make uh, the Brethren out of the filth. Right here he says... Uh, the Basili, the Spirilla, the Coxie, disgusting names for disgusting things, and from these tiny harbingers of death in wonder and genius unparalleled, the Celestials remixed their genetic coding to fashion a new race, one that looked humanoid, thought humanoid, but alas, it was nothing close. And thus were born the Brethren. Uh, so I was like, wow, these are words I haven't read since, uh, uh, since science class back in school. So that was kind of funny. But when you go that way, you go that way where you start going full science and you start trying to come up with logical explanations for how these guys are. Then I start going down that rabbit trail and I'm like, how, how though do they, do they transmutate themselves to resemble people? And do they have all the chemicals in their brains that, that allow them to, to have emotions basically and, and anger and will and love and all that stuff and hatred? And it's like, okay, I don't, I'm not going to overthink it. It's a really goofy story. And uh, anyway... Just gonna keep going along. So the collector reveals that uh, he he decided to use the brethren because they, they they were made by the celestials to pretty much go along, wipe out uh, species, and uh, until the celestials lost interest in the brethren, and just kind of forgot about them, and then the collector collector just scooped them up in his collection. That was kind of lame to me too. The celestials uh, are very enigmatic, but I don't think that they would just forget or just like I don't care I don't care about that little science experiment the brethren anymore uh, there could have been a probably a little better written reason of why the uh, why the Eternals just kind of gave up on the brethren I would have probably even accepted it if uh, the collector by force uh, just took them into his collection or something and then escaped the celestials or something like that 
Uh, but now he spilled the beans, so now everyone knows the truth of their disgusting origins. Sybil Dorn, uh, in her last moments, tries to comfort Thane Ector, and then uh, she says, uh, but I am here now, with you forever. And the collector just goes, I think not. Pledges of fidelity bore me. I was like, damn! And he just blasts her away. And I was like, whoa, that made me laugh. He's really, what a dick. And uh, so then Thane Actor just hates the Collector even more. He starts blasting away at all of the Brethren and turning them into giant floating muck. Giant floating, pretty much a glob of bacteria. And uh, the Avengers are like, oh my gosh, we gotta stop them. They're gonna cover the city in minutes and wipe out, uh, wipe out the human race. And uh, they pretty much start fighting uh, these globs of bacteria floating there. Uh, it's not doing a whole lot of good. And I was kind of thinking, if they're going to wipe out the human race, are they going to infect them with some sort of sickness or illness? But they're like, just, they're getting all up in its business and just trying to punch these globs. So it's like, what are these globs' plan? To just attach itself to every human and suffocate it because it's a floating glob? Because it's not really spreading a sickness to me. It's not like the Avengers are in, uh, uh, in like bubble suits or something, protecting themselves from an infection. Even right here. Uh, Rage says, uh, Herkster punching these slimy blobs is about as effective as fighting silly putty. And Hercules says, Friend Rage, thou doth often say I am difficult to understand, but know this, thou art equally inscrutable to the Prince of Power. I pray thee no insult is meant. And then Rage says, Hey, I'm chill. That kind of made me laugh here at the final part. It's uh, uh, the kind of tables turn and their little banter that they keep sharing in this series. I really like this exchange between the the collector, the souped up Super Saiyan collector, and the Watcher. And uh, the Watcher is not not an elder of the universe, but he is also like this incredibly long living or even immortal being from the universe. And he pretty much tries to reason with him, and he tells him, "Hey, you know that the Earth has serves a greater purpose." And uh, he says, uh, "Why else would you have sought to hide your involvement in in the crime from me?" Uh, humanity doesn't deserve this, and, and as an elder, you know there's a greater destiny uh, uh, than to end up uh, in your intergalactic zoo. And then the collector pretty much tells him, like, "Hey, man, we're 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 just we're we just make up the balance of the universe. You know what you do, you watch, and what I do, I do. I collect. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna collect." And he tells him, uh, uh, "So weep for humanity, watcher, but do not dare judge me." Even like it right here, we refer to him as Watu, his real name. So even the collector knows his real name. Like you can tell that they've known each other an incredibly long time. These cosmic beings even refers to him as old friend here. That they have just kind of that interesting little relationship. Uh, then right here, Thane Hector, totally beaten, totally defeated. Uh, the fool starts crying out like he's. Uh, it brings back the fact that they have a uh, some sort of telepathic connection. The fool feels the pain the fear of all the brethren wandering aimlessly as bacterial blobs and Thane Hector kind of cradles him crying right here. Weird scene, weird panel, but you know, uh, these are these are characters that we're really starting to sympathize for, I guess, even though they're still, still murderers. <laughs> and then, blah blah blah, fighty fight, Hercules gets in a good punch, but the Collector is going Super Saiyan. Cersei has this idea, so I'm, I, I really don't understand her powers. She's pretty much going to enhance Thane Ector and the Fool's connection uh, through the rest of the Brethren. Uh, and Quasar is going to put in this, this barrier to kind of shield all that energy, I think. Uh, just pretty much all the, all the flashy fireworks. Um, he reaches out, he even feels Sybil Dorn floating in the air, reaches out and makes all the blobs of bacteria come together and form this brain as the as the Watcher refers to as the Unimind. So it pretty much looks like this giant brain. That is the uh, collective of all the brethren now. The Collector, uh, the Collector starts freaking out. He's saying like, oh, no way, the, the brethren were never known to do this. He says, uh, what is this? It's reaching out to me. Wraps himself around it. This giant brain is now fighting the giant Collector. And uh, he even calls out to the Watcher and says, I cannot free myself. I'm being pulled in. Watu, help me. And then uh, the Watcher says, I'm sorry, Collector, but as you reminded me this evening, all I'm allowed to do is watch. I was like, damn, that's that's cool. And then pretty much the, the, the giant brain, the Unimind, hugs the Collector and explodes. And that's the end. <laughs> we know the Collector's not dead. 
We'll see him again in the future, but uh, obviously that form of the collector, that giant souped up collector, uh, we'll never see that again. That was that was weird. Uh, let's just let's just forget about that, I guess. I mean, I'm glad it exists, but uh, it's the collector never looks like that again. And then over here, uh, it killed the fool, and uh, Thanactor says, uh, "Sleep well, little one." Cersei's crying and uh, kisses Thanactor one last time. Uh, with the fact that they were, they could have potentially become lovers, and then he dies. So in the end, uh, Thane, Ector, uh, or the Brethren became the warrior race uh, that Thane, Ector always wanted them to be. Uh, one page later, here, here's kind of a little epilogue of Cersei, Captain America, and the Watcher all standing on a rooftop together, just, uh, just watching the stars. Kind of cool imagery, good imagery right there. Cersei doesn't quite understand why she... Uh, why she's crying over a person that she should have absolutely hated. This kind of uh, reflects on how ironic that is. And uh, Captain America's like, hey, yeah, he was, uh, he was a troubled man, but in the end he found his dream. And uh, that is the end. That's the end of that six issues of the collection of Session. So yeah, let me know what you think of that in the comments. Really weird, really goofy cosmic story. Yeah, we, I, I looked it up. We never see Thane, Hector, or the uh, Brethren again. Although Marvel did start a new Eternals series. So uh, with, the fact that, uh, with the fact that it was detrimental that the Brethren were created by the Celestials, like the Eternals, so they were like the other side of that coin, maybe we'll see the, uh, the Brethren again someday uh, in the pages of this new Eternals series. That'd be interesting. That'd be cool. And I uh, don't think that they'll be making a giant $200 million blockbuster movie of this story, though. <laughs> it was good. It was entertaining. Uh, first issue sticks out like a sore thumb to me. Uh, they do mention at some point, I think Crystal mentions that, uh, like, hey, how's Quicksilver doing? I was like, I don't know. He's, uh, he's up to uh, something other, other going on. And uh, other comics that I have kind of filled in that gap were pretty much right after this. Then he appears in the pages of X Factor when Peter David Peter David took over X Factor right along here, and then uh, Quicksilver appears and joins that team, and uh, and then uh, stays in that book for a while. So uh, that's the thing about being a Quicksilver fan. I gotta go around and hunt around for these issues, uh, <laughs> but kind of interesting stuff. Would have been cool to have Quicksilver in the rest of this story at least because he was in the first issue. Um, so that would have been really cool to have him appear, maybe even in the end. To join the fight there at the end and uh, yeah entertaining uh, not really any character development this was just to get Bob Harris started get him to start cutting his teeth on writing duty uh, introduce Crystal as a member of this team and you know this was uh, this was fun it was good it was good I liked it recommend uh, of course if an event like this came out nowadays it'd be the big blockbuster marvel event series of the year and there'd be a billion tie-ins that no one would buy and uh, just be a dead horse beaten to death and uh but yeah this is a good fun 90s story let me know what you think let me know about what you think of bob harris's uh story his writing and his uh first story arc on his uh long avengers run let me know what you think about this art by Steve Epping or these Ron Lim covers or this Andy Kubert issue at the beginning. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, go out, support your local comic store. Thank you for checking out this video. Talk to you later.